Hello, my name is John Lakos. I work at Bloomberg. Bloomberg was nice enough to allow me and my team to do some real research for the first time in a long time. We spent a ton of Bloomberg's money doing it. I don't regret it. All right. So here, this is the talk, local arena memory allocators. Uh, this is the copyright that I'm required to put up, so it's on film. As far as I'm concerned, anybody who wants to take advantage of this can, but there's some rules. Uh, this is the abstract. It's on camera, but since you're already here, you don't need to read that. You're going to see all the slides. Um, did I pass something by? No, I didn't. That's okay. I've been going back and forth. In fact, it's very interesting. There's a lot about memory that's in common with my memory and trying to look at the slides. They're all jumbled in my head because I've been jumping all around, which will be very relevant. So uh, this is the outline. Brief introduction. The original introduction went 80 minutes, and I had to squeeze it. So it was a different talk entirely. It was more like, when do you pass allocators around? But that's not this talk. Uh, we're going to talk about understanding the problem. This is the beef right here. And then the conclusions should be easy to draw. So three is the beef. So let's get to three as quickly as we can. Introduction and background. Why do we like C++? It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Okay, is that, is that reasonable? Let's us fine tune, and we can deliver very high runtime performance. Now, my friend Pablo Halpern told me that this is C. C++ does this and gives you low cost abstraction. Thank you, Pablo. Why should we care about memory allocators? Kind of the same thing. They enable us to fine tune at a low level when needed, and they can help us improve runtime performance. Kind of makes sense. We don't need them in Java. We need them in C++. What are the benefits? Not all memory is alike. In case you thought all memory is alike, it is not. Uh, there are other qualitative benefits. When we can insert an instrumented allocator in the right spot, we can detect bugs. Oh, yeah, it might affect runtime performance. OK. Um, so when I was at Bear Stearns, I was Remember, I was sitting in what they called the, uh, the fishbowl. There were like five chairs in one room with glass, and people would stick their nose in the fishbowl and look at us. And one time, this fellow came from Credit Derivatives, and he said, you know, I've got this model. And I build it up really quickly, and, and I use it, and then I get rid of it. It takes 10 seconds to get rid of it. So that was a problem. So I looked at it a little while, and I wrote this book in 1996. I just flipped quickly to chapter 10, did a little work, boom. We went from 10 seconds to doesn't show up on quantify at all. OK, next. Um, and it went to Bloomberg. They have this thing called Finch memory. They memory map their process static data space to I.O. so they can swap out an entire running process and then later swap it back in has the same addresses, and it works like a charm. It's genius, I tell you. But you can't do that with STL. Not the STL I knew. So I had a choice. I could either not use the STL containers, or I could grab a, 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 an open source version and insert allocators into them. And they told me that when I did that, that I was messing with the standard. They used another word. Uh, and, and so I. I later, it was about 2006, 7? 2007, I joined the standards committee. Then I really messed with the standard. OK. In 2006, somebody, and by the way, when I say user interface, I don't mean API. I mean somebody's typing at the Bloomberg, and it's slow. And they do some stuff, and it's fast. What stuff did they do? People who didn't like me pre-2006 now tell me that Allocators are the best thing I've ever done. And that includes my personal life, like my three daughters, my wife, all of that. That does not compare, according to this gentleman, to these allocators. I will leave him nameless. He knows who he is. What are the common arguments against allocators? Somebody give me an argument. Please, please be the devil's advocate. Give me a, why wouldn't we want allocators? Allocators are part, so we wouldn't want them because they were originally designed in a kind of Baroque way, right? Or broke way. They mess with hyper 
They me- how do they mess with type regularity? Okay, you have to ca- copy an allocator around. What does that mean? What does it mean to you to copy an allocator? That's the whole point, right? What does it mean? Slow. Well, it, it means that you either copy some state. What are you copying? Are you copying the memory that the allocator gives you? No, you're copying, you're copying a reference. To okay, so you're passing around a pointer. And, and no. you're basically... Copy yeah, the off. problem is your regular type... Their allocator is aliens, right? And regular types are not allowed to alias. So All right, so it sounds to me like whoever designed allocators did so too quickly. I know who did it, and I know why. Wasn't, wasn't the right design. I know that very well. Very, very well indeed. All right, anyway, some good arguments. Requires more upfront design. That is a fact. If you start to deal with allocators, there's a new thing you have to think about. Just when const came along, and we started using const correctness. You either use it everywhere where it's appropriate, or you don't. There's no in-between. And Matt Austin pointed this out back in 2007. I think it's a great analogy. Allocators are like constant steroids. If you're in, you're all the way in. Otherwise, you're out. Complicates user interfaces. Well, that's to be determined. C++ 03, yeah, it sure does. C++ 11, not so much. We'll, we'll, we're not going to talk about that here. If I did, talk would go for eight hours. Not going to do it. May actually degrade performance. Absolutely, it may degrade performance because when you don't need an allocator, but you still have to accommodate the possibility that someone else does, maybe your code where you don't really care about allocators will run slower. We don't need a special allocator, or maybe somebody chooses a bad allocator. This happens all the time in my company. Thank goodness we have a talk now So I can teach my company not to do this. It's not their fault. They don't know. Anyway, we can address these things only with well-supported facts, careful measurement. Measurement is the key. We can talk all we want about crazy stuff. We don't have the numbers. Nope. Not going to waste my time anymore. Main memory. This is, I'm sure you guys know this better than I do. This is main memory. It looks exactly like this. And I want to point out that this is the processing unit right here. You can tell that it's been used a lot. You see the two gradients here because those wheels have been spinning around. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. But anyway, when the computer starts up, they turn. And you see we've, we've accessed memory. And when we access memory, you know, the computer turns. It kind of goes together. And I just want you to enjoy this now because I did this only for the first few slides because this is maddeningly tedious to do. So we're not going to do that. But you notice how things are clustering? Okay, so then somebody came up with this wonderful idea called cache memory. And cache memory is something you put between the main memory and the CPU. I know somebody during this talk is going to tell me, John, there's more than one cache. Really? Okay. So I know that, but I'm just trying to keep it simple. So now we access the memory. What happens? Everybody knows, clearly everybody in this room knows that a cache line is moved into the cache all in one shot. And uh, we access something else, and it's not on the same cache line, so it gets moved in too. And then by luck, we access something close by. Who would have thought? And it's already there. And it's already there. And it's already there. And then some person decides to write to the cache line, and we don't know what happens, but maybe it it just ejects the whole cache line back, and uh, it's gone. Now somebody else does something Right, said, now look, there's room. We can put that cache line right back where it came from. Another place. So the cache is allowed to break things in and throw things out and does whatever it does. We don't care about the details. That's all we care about. That's how it works. Okay? Main memory segments. If you took ever took any course in operating systems, you load the static part, stack goes down or up, and dynamic uh, memory goes up or down. And yes, I know there are more stacks in multi-threaded programs, and Dietmar also explained to me that when we have code routines, there'll be even more stacks. Don't worry about that. What is a memory allocator? Does anybody want to try? What is it? Thing that allocates memory. Excellent. <laughs> it's a thing that allocates memory. So C language memory allocation. We have this general purpose. Who's heard of malloc? 
So it gets memory, for, uh, the dynamic memory, right? Now there's another one called Allegay. Who's heard of Allegay? Is it good or bad? Okay, it's an open-ended question. It gets memory from the program stack. There is no, there's no way to give it back until you leave the program stack. Allegay is for adults. Memory allocator organizes a region of computer memory dispensing and reclaiming authorized access to suitable subregions on demand. So now we have general and special purpose allocators. And I think we all know that something like a malloc works. I'm putting this up here. I'm not going to read this slide. And then special purpose allocators don't work all the time. But when they do work, they work really well. And we can't have compilers putting in special purpose allocators because the compilers will never be smart enough to be omniscient. Okay? And if anybody thinks they are, great. We'll start a business together. It's all good. All right. Then we have this uh, global versus local allocator. Global allocators are kind of, there's one. It's over there. We can get it anytime we want to. Um, like Malik. Malik's a global allocator. Then there's these uh, local allocators. And turns out that alloc A is local in the sense that it, it, the memory that it's dispensing isn't globally accessible at any given time. So physically, it's not there. And then temporally, it might not be around for the whole process. So you might have an allocator that lives for a little while and then dies. So in the space-time continuum, there's a coordinate. And that's where that allocator is valid. So global general allocators, we have malloc in C, we have new in C++. So I just put this thing up to give you an idea. You know, general global kind of goes together, local special kind of go together, but the other two are possible. And if you're in a single threaded program, why do you want to lock every time you allocate memory? Okay, Marshall has confirmed that I'm not crazy. No, he didn't do that. He just said I got the right answer there. A memory allocator is a staple utility or mechanism. Those are my terms, but I wanted to throw them in. Mechanism means it doesn't try to represent a value. So that's not what it's doing. Uh, Organizes a region of computer memory, dispensing and reclaiming authorized access to suitable subregions on demand. The regions need not be continu contiguous. So now we introduce this idea of a local allocator. And look, it's sitting here, and it might not live for the life of the program, but for right now, that's where it is. So what does a local allocator look like? Well, uh, you create one. And when you create a local allocator, you can also give it a range to operate on. If you don't give one, one will be appointed for you, maybe, or maybe not. So if you give it begin end, local allocator says, thank you, I'll deal with that. Uh, they can allocate and deallocate. Please do not take the slides seriously. If I had to make them compile, they wouldn't fit here, and I wouldn't be done. So in case you find it, there are some things that are deliberately broken. And that's OK. One of the nice things about local allocators is we can tell the allocator, everything that you allocated, we were just kidding. Get rid of it. We can do that for a local allocator. We can't do that for a global allocator. All right, so memory allocator is the client-facing interface for a stateful utility or mechanism that organizes a region of uh, a computer memory dispensing and reclaiming authorized access to suitable subregions on demand. Don't have to be contiguous regions. OK, now you know what it is. Uh, we can supply them in multiple ways as stateful utilities, like malloc and fray. Uh, but that doesn't support objects. We can use what I'm calling a reference wrapper, which is we're going to pretend that allocators are copyable, even though they're not. And we're going to wrap them up in this nice little reference wrapper, which is syntactically incorrect here, but we're going to do that. And the good news about that is, well, the allocator type is available for use by the client's compilers. The compiler can look in. It's very wonderful because it's all done in compile time. You can look in and go, wow, I know what's going on. I'm going to be really fast. Unfortunately, it forces our client to be a template in order to hold an allocator reference. That's bad. Uh, it affects the C++ type. That's bad. So we'd like to fix that so we can pass it around using good old object-oriented programming as an abstract base class. And that's really nice because now we can hold on to it, right? We can hold on to it by its base class. That's awesome. It doesn't need to be a template. 
And the allocator doesn't affect the C++ type of the object. And if we wanted to, though it's not important, we don't have to decide at compile time. We could decide at runtime, but that's not important. What's important is the flexibility in software engineering not to have to make something a template that otherwise wouldn't be. Okay? But there's this other matter. Must be accessed via virtual function interface, and we all know that they're dog slow, right? We all know that. Like, we wouldn't even have this discussion. And the other thing is, we might have to store an extra pointer size in our data structure, and of course, that's going to kill performance. It's going to go right down the tubes. We all know that. So we're not even going to talk about that anymore. Any questions? That's the introduction. Not too bad. Not great, though. It's 15 minutes. Oh, dear. <sighs> Anything? Well, now you know where we are. So let me tell you, I was asked by my, my friend Dietmar to prove that allocators are useful at all, because he was questioning that, because a lot of smart people tried to determine whether they're, they were valuable or not, and nah, they're not, they're not useful. So I said, well, how am I going to do this? Now, I already told you I know they are because I've been using them for 20 years and people that use them with me are happy people. If you tried to take the allocators away from the people that use them, they will attack you like a vicious bear. So I know this, but that's not good enough. So we're not going to accept anecdotal stuff. We're going to try to figure out what on earth are we going to do to figure this problem out. So I really did write this this flow chart down. I said, this is the flow chart. We're going we're gonna to solve this. So should we supply an allocator? If it's no, we're done. But if the answer is yes, should we pass it via base class or should we invade the type using a template parameter? Well, either way, then we're going to have to decide what allocator, basic allocator strategy, the basic one, we're going to use. We'll talk about them. And then no matter which one, we're going to have to decide are we going to do that nasty trick where we tell the alley, local allocator, just kidding, bye? Or are we going to go through and destroy and deallocate each and every individual instance that was allocated? Now, if you guys you know, write in different languages, sometimes Java, sometimes C++, you're going to do that, go through and delete every single one. But if you're a game uh, writer, no, you're not. OK. Anyway, we get to the bottom over here, and that's where we are. So this is our tool chest. You can write allocators in so many ways I can't tell you. What's the most famous allocator that anybody can name right off the top of their head who's at least 50 years old? <laughs> Stud allocator. Lab. Okay, it's called the, the Lee, Doug Lee, Lee, Al Lee algorithm. It's called, I believe, I sure hope so, it's a co coalescing allocator. And back in the day when memory was short, uh, uh, not short, let's say that, um, th we had to do things a little differently than we do today. Virtual memory helps a lot. And so things are a little different today. And so today, general purpose allocators tend to be pooling allocators, not coalescing allocators. I know you all care. We don't have any coalescing allocators in the standard. We have only two. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So we have the global allocator. And we can pass to the global allocator, we can pass it via a type parameter or an abstract base class. Those are the two ways we can deal with global memory. So that means when we're using the global allocator, that is it. We have two options. But when we're using local allocators, we have three. We have something called a monotonic allocator. I will explain this. We have something called a multi-pool allocator. I will explain that. And we can actually chain them and do a multi-pool backed by a monotonic. Now, I'm not a big fan of templates, I got to tell you, because people misuse them sometimes. When I say I'm not a fan, I'm not a fan when they're misused. Notice I use template notation here because that reads multi-pool parameterized by monotonic, and that's exactly what it is. It's saying when you're using the multi-pool, if it, if, it, if it runs out and needs more memory, it goes to the monotonic. So the notation is awesome. All right, then the next thing is we can pass by a, a type parameter or an abstract base. And then on top of that, we can do normal destruction or wink it out, right? Can't do that over there. So that gives us 12. So we have 14 allocation strategies. That's it. Now, of course, there are an unbounded number of allocation strategies. We're going to live with 14 for the purposes of this talk. Good? Anybody disappointed? 14's not enough? Okay. So here they are. Quickly remember everything on this chart. 
So allocation strategy one is the default allocator. So there it is. That's one and two. And so here, the standard allocator, allocate and deallocate, we just implement in terms of new and delete. My dear friend Pablo tells me that this is an oversimplification and in fact, we could build a whole bunch of data structures on top of this as long as eventually we go to the one supplied uh, source. So, but this is good. All right, then we're gonna look at whether we pass it by a type parameter or an abstract base class. So here we are, this is passing it by a, a type parameter and either one is the same. Notice that this would be allocator of int. Not only was there not enough space, I refused to write that. <laughs> this is a type parameter. Normal destruction, that's what we got, normal destruction. So what does it mean? We build the system up, we do our benchmark, and then we delete it. I'm sure everybody noticed that I used the old style for loops. It's because I'm old. But believe it or not, I can use the new stuff. I can even do it there, but I'm not going to because I want to see the, very clearly what we're walking over. So I'm not gonna do that again. However, I don't care here, so I'm gonna let that stand. Just saying. Now we need to do AS2, and the only difference is we're gonna pass the global allocator in via an abstract base class. It looks like this, that's the abstract base class. Again, I'm abstracting this because I can't deal with the cruft that's in the current standard, so I just have to pretend it isn't there. Okay, allocate and deallocate. This is the derived class. Look at this, concrete derived class. Notice how it works, it overrides. I even use the override, I love it, love it. Does anybody see a bug in this? Won't compile, why? Look at those inlines. It's inline and I've inlined it, Alistair. Alistair Meredith tells me this doesn't compile. I don't care. I wanted to inline this so badly I had to put it twice. <laughs> yes, I'm serious. Does anybody think I'm even joking a little bit? Not joking. Okay. Abstract base class, here we are with my function. This is via protocol, and guess what? Virtual functions can be inlined and not with whole program optimization either. We're not even thinking about that in this. That's just fantasy. If you don't believe me, we'll have a drink at the bar later, I'll explain. All right, normal destruction. So we create this, and I'm playing fast and loose. This is the uh, C++17 polymorphic memory resource uh, subsystem, and we'll build the thing up, do the benchmark, destroy it, and that's normal destruction. Then, we'll go to a new allocator uh, strategy, it's called monotonic. I want you to have some sympathy for me. A guy that's worked for me for 10 years, graduated from Caltech, his name will be left out, came to me and said, John, I saw your talk, it was great. I have no idea what a monotonic allocator is, I have no idea what a multiple allocator is, I just use them. Okay, he works on my team. So I started doing some things. So this is a buffer on the program stack. That's the typical way you use a monotonic allocator because getting the, 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 the stack, which is uh, warm, as they say, uh, and then using that memory is about as good as it gets. Warm means it's already in the cache. So the stack is going like this and whatever. All right, so it's gonna use this buffer on the stack. Now, this is how it works when you allocate memory. Inside, we're going inside the, the monotonic allocator, there's a buffer. It's an external buffer. Could be internal, but it's external for the purposes of this. So then I, I picked little types because I didn't have a lot of room. So I want to allocate a char. So where does it go? It goes at the beginning. No problem. Assuming the buffer is aligned, even if it's not for a char, it doesn't matter. Now I have another char. Where does it go? Right next to it. Now I have another char. Where does it go? Right next to it. Oh, now I have a short. Where does it go? No. Uh, uh, it gets aligned. It's called natural alignment. So the, the size of the object divides its address. Okay? Now I got an int. Where does it go? Uh, right there. Don't know. I mean, yeah. I didn't put double in here just for you. 
Now, sure, where does it go? It's fine. Where does the char go? It's fine. Where does an int go? Not fine. Do you get the idea? Natural alignment's all good. Everybody knew this. This, is, this has been known forever. You didn't need to see this, right? What you do need to see is how good I've got the PowerPoint. <laughs> when you overflow the buffer, it just turns into something that does geometric growth like that. I needed some breaks in the middle, so I started programming. I want you to know how many hours it takes to do this. It's not even funny. By the way, when you try to delete from, from one of these, these uh, 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 monotonic allocators, they don't give the memory back, and that's going to be a problem. So be careful. Okay. Uh, so then we have type parameters. We have abstract base class. We've already talked about that. I don't have to say it again. It's the same idea. Normal destruction. So I've done this a little different now. I've broken out the allocation, deallocation, and the destruction, destruction into two pieces because we don't want to conflate them because they're not the same thing, right? Destroy, deallocate. Allocate, construct, right? So we can use this wrapper, and the wrapper is going to wrap up the allocators. This is the way we're going to do it with the type system. And uh, we're going to create this thing called a buffered sequential allocator. And it doesn't take any range, so it's not going to use the program stack, but it could. But it's not going to. Uh, then we're going to allocate, for each of these array things, we're going to allocate individually the memory. Uh, and then... Uh, yeah so, that, yeah, so so we're allocating this thing, and then for each one of these guys, we're going to new the pointer. And then we're going we're gonna to destroy it, and then we're going to deallocate it. That's the order, right? So let me just say this again. We allocate, construct, deallocate, excuse me, destroy, deallocate in that order. Okay? Now, that's normal destruction. Now we're going to move on to magically wink out. I know you guys love this part. So I could have done is I could say, you know what? When this thing goes out of scope, all the memory is going away anyway. I'm not going to delete it. I'm not going to deallocate it, I mean. So it's gone. Your program works just fine, just a little faster. But then we get crazy. We say, you know, I'm not even going to destroy the damn thing. It's just gone. And that works perfectly fine as long as you don't have a resource involved other than memory. And of course, the memory has to come from the allocator that you're working, which it does. Anybody uncomfortable with this? Okay, good. You're normal people. It's legal C++. I agree. I'm so uncomfortable. That's okay. <laughs> Train wrecks are uncomfortable too, but you got to watch. <laughs> All right, normal destruction, magically winked. We'll go to multipool. So multipool looks like this. Basically, you have a bunch of things, and then you start allocating, and you have these adaptive pools. And uh, basically, it just goes and goes, and each time you need something of a different size, it gets it from the right size. And of course, if you have to give something back now, that's OK, because timing is off. Each adaptive pool maintains its own free list. So you just put it back, get it, put it back, get it. It's all good. Um, how many people think they could do this in under an hour? PowerPoint, I mean. <laughs> Don't even think about it. All right. Notice the uh, top is 2048. If you allocate something larger than 2048, it's a pass through to the backing allocator. So if you had a complex strategy, it would go straight to the underlying uh, uh, monotonic, for example, if you started with a, a, a multi-pool built on top of a monotonic. Uh, and these things are all the same. It's really, there's no point in going through it. This is what it looks like, multi-pool monotonic global. You get the idea. I don't want to belabor it. It's really what you think it is. So what are the basic size parameters? We asked ourselves. Uh, two fundamental ones are like the number of instructions. If you're doing a trillion instructions, OK, there's some beef there. Uh, the number of working threads. And notice that these are architecture independent. Uh, what aspects of software affect optimal allocation strategy? This is where the rubber hits the road. When I look at a problem, how do I characterize it in some way that would give me a clue? Like I could ask a question. Like you're building a system. What's it like? Tell me about it, right? Somebody, this is you know Family Feud? 
We're playing Family Feud right now. Somebody give me an aspect of a program that would matter in terms of whether I'd want a local allocator or which local allocator. Frequency of allocations. Excellent. Number one answer. What else? Uh, pattern of new, new versus free, or allocate versus free. That's number four. <laughs> What's V stand for? Velocity. No. V. Variation in allocated sizes. What does L stand for? Lakos. Locality of accessed memory. That's a complex one. We have a whole benchmark just for that one. In fact, we have a whole benchmark for utilization, which is how much of the memory that you've asked for stays in residence at one time. The answer is all of it, that matters. The answer is little of it, that matters. Finally, contention, and that's going to apply only to the final benchmark. Now, it turns out these dimensions are not orthogonal, but what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to map them on to 0 to 1, where 0 is no, and 1 is as much as it can be, and everything in the middle is meh. All right. So that's what I just said. The dimensions are far from independent. Let's look at density. The idea is if you don't allocate anything, you don't need to worry about an allocator. And if you do allocate a lot of things, well, that's mostly what you're doing is allocating and deallocating, and you don't really do anything else in your program, well, then you're just messing around. Uh, but that's okay. But you get the idea. If there are a lot of allocation and deallocation strategies, uh, uh, allocation and deallocation uh, operations going on, whatever their order, then this is relevant. Consider populating a vector using pushback. If you populate a vector using pushback, let's say to a million, how many operations are going on here? Certainly the million, right? Plus some others. How many allocation operations are going on if you don't pre-size it? 20. Would you say this has closer to zero or closer to one on the, on the allocations for the vector? Closer to zero, good, you get the idea. So now how about variation? I think you get the idea. If all the, they're all the same size, well, that's a zero. If they're all different, that's a one. Now this one is extremely hard, and with some luck you'll appreciate it, maybe. Locality has two parts to it. Locality has the temporal part, and it has the physical part. Because remember I said there, there's a two-dimensional space going on here? So L is roughly, and I made this up so I could be wrong, L equals I over MT to a zeroth order approximation. The only way this is valid is, the, in other words, when M goes up in the subregion, your locality goes down. When the number of transitions goes up, your locality goes down. That's all it means, just an inverse relationship. If you forget about the temporal part, then physical locality is the number of instructions hitting a, a chunk of memory. And if you think about the temporal part, it's the number of instructions you execute before you go away. Does that make sense? So if I execute a million instructions and then go away, that's very different from I execute an instruction and go away. Okay. So you get the idea roughly? Say yes. You're not going to be held to this. Can everybody read this, please? Just read it. Does anybody not believe it? If you don't believe it, read it again. Read it until you believe it. Does anybody think this is false? Come on, be honest. Tell me why. Because? Because you read all the signs that you must not allocate a lot. And then they're not correlated. Wait, wait. I said the lo locality can play a critical role. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm asking you to disagree with me. Are you agreeing with me? Oh, I heard, uh, okay. It's hard to disagree with that. All right, does anybody want to try really hard to disagree with it? This is really true. All right, utilization. This turns out to be a big one, utilization. You're going to ask yourself this question more than you think. If memory is repeatedly allocated and deallocated, your utilization is minimal. If you allocate everything you're going to allocate before you deallocate anything, it's maximal. And there's everything in between. The trouble is, once it's not maximal, 
you're in dangerous territory if you use certain allocators. Consider these guys. In this benchmarking, we're going to assume that we reserve the entire vector, so there's one allocation. And in string, we're going to deliberately exceed the threshold. Whoops, sorry. Deliberately exceed the threshold so that um, we always allocate different sizes dynamically. So this is always long string. In fact, we're going to allocate strings randomly from 33 to 1,000. It'll turn out I'm getting ahead of myself. And then, of course, contention. We're going to forget about contention until the final benchmark, because by that time, you'll be so tired, you won't care. Uh, if there's only one thread, we don't care. If the maximum is everybody is just allocating and deallocating, that's all they do. I got a whole bunch of threads, that's all they do. Again, people have time on their hands. Contention is strongly correlated with allocation density. So now, if you look at this, we have this DVLUC, and we need a mnemonic. If you haven't seen the paper, the mnemonic is Divluck the Duck. Remember Divluck the Duck. OK, any questions? Oh, we're whipping through here. Good? I'm supposed to end at 4? It's possible. All right, considerations. So uh, we wanted to explore each dimension independently. So the goal was we'll find some problem, the mother of all problems, and we'll just get the centroid of that problem and just tweak each dimension, de-dimensionalize it, and just say, this is the way it works. Yeah, good luck. That was hard. So we settled on four different benchmarks, one for the first two and one for each of the remaining three. As my mother used to say, do the doable. Ah, we try not to assume the answers. This is remarkably hard. You get five people who think they know everything, put them in a room, they don't need no stinking experiment. They'll just tell you what it is. So we tried not to do that, meaning I insisted we try things even though we thought we knew the answer. We we're going to try a wide range of things. In fact, we were going to vary this experiment over many powers of two, a large number of powers of two, from zero to a big number. And we're just going to trade things off and see how things fall, and they fall where they may. Life is good. Um, we're going to contrast different aspects. We're going to double this and have this. And so the two aspects are subsystem size and number of subsystems, subsystem iteration, and experimental repetition. If we're inside a subsystem, we do it twice instead of once, we'll half the number of experiment, experimental repetitions. If we're doing it four times, it'll be a quarter. Eight times, it'll be a, uh, an eight. You see the pattern? It will add up to the same thing. So I have to put this up here because we tried many platforms. We tried a whole bunch of things. We chose this one because it was typical, not because it was good or bad, typical. And we have all the data published so you can look at all the different platforms with all the different settings, all the different compilers, Clang, GCC, even, uh, I think we even have a Windows compiler. We did it with all of them. But the data is overwhelming as it, as it is right now. Um, OK, so only benchmark four used concurrency. Uh, does anybody want to recommend that I just give up on local allocators? We'll just use one of these global implementations? Because they're so good. Lord knows people have worked on that a lot longer than I've worked on it. So are these good enough? Yes. Who says yes? No. You do? I, I know them as good. They're good enough. You mean, you mean I don't need local allocators because they're really good enough? I think you need local allocators. So they're not good enough in all cases. <laughs> so we tried these instead of the ones we tried these instead of the ones that came with GCC. They weren't better. GCC has learned the tricks of the trade, and it's just fine. Uh, so that's not going to solve our problems. I want to explain to people there will Yes? Primary cases where GC not be good enough, you're going to outperform, it's going to be in, in a, a concurrent outcome. Of course. So does that same property hold for? It holds in spades. Now, I'm not saying it's better than GCC. I'm saying local allocators will kick it in so seven I, ways I, from Tuesday. I, I believe that. Okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to, no. We didn't use concurrency as the metric 
for that. So just, just to be clear, Bryce is saying, if you're doing concurrent programming and you want to do better without any fuss, you can drop one of these things in and for, for in all likelihood it will, to some degree, but not an order of magnitude, outperform GCC, right? Not an order of magnitude. Uh, I think not on the system that you have here, on a system with a much higher degree of concurrency, it might be. Okay, we're saying, we're saying this could make a huge difference in concurrent operations. I will take your word for it. I'll put my local allocator any day, any day, any day. All right, so we have these four benchmarks. So the first one is short running. Now, the purpose of, of this, I want to give you an image of a short running program. Everybody ready? This is a short running program. <laughs> you launch it, it flies, it blows up. You got it? This happens all the time in request response. Somebody read the, the script. Don't you like the picture? I love that picture. I'm just like, yeah, go. All right, so considerations. We wanted to investigate allocation density. Um, so we focused on that. We, we, uh, we chose a variety of common data structures. You could argue with the data structures, but I thought these were useful data structures. They're typical. We didn't want access locality to dominate, so we deliberately kept the access to a minimum. More realistically, we wouldn't, and then we would get conflated results. We didn't want that. Um, later, we incorporated variation, and so as I said, the vectors are pre-allocated to give uh, uh, one, one, one thing, but the strings are 33 to 1,000 because of our threshold at 32 for the short string optimization. So here are some simple data structures. Everybody in this room knows these data structures. They know how they're implemented. I know. I'm still going to show you. Do you mind? It'll be quick. This is an array of int. This is a, a, a vector of int. This is a vector of string. This is an unordered set of int. This is an unordered set of string. Aren't you glad you saw them? Do you need to see them again, or are you good? Good, OK. The plan, we're going to create it, access it likely, destroy it, and repeat until we've done it enough times that we can measure it. Does anybody need to see pictures of what that looks like? Build it up, use it, throw it away, repeat. OK? All right. We chose this amount of instructions because that's all the patience we had. Now n equals 2 to the 27th, we're saying 27. We can't be bothered writing a big 2 that we all know and a tiny little number that matters, so we're going to use exponents. These are all exponents of 2. Remember that. If you see a number, you go, wait a minute, this doesn't add up. Every result that you see is going to be runtime in seconds. Keep that in mind. So for vector event, here are the 14 allocation strategies. The sizes are down the left. This is all crystal clear, right? So remember that those are all times in seconds. Not helpful, right? You know why? Because it doesn't have any headers. Look at those nice uh, headers. Now you know it's a vector, and you know we have global monotonic multipool and multipool of mono. For the global, we have only. Uh, the regular way and, 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 and uh, a virtual fu a function call, whereas with the local ones, we have the parameterized type and the virtual, that's the next significant bit, and then for each of those, we have wink it or don't wink it. Now, I know this will help. If we add that, you can see better. In fact, let's put the line all the way down. See, it's getting better, right? I have to ask this question. Anybody ever see The Wizard of Oz? What happens when Dorothy lands in Oz from Kansas? What happens? No, not the witch. No, she lands in Oz. What happens? Color. So these are the colors we're going to love. Now, the best thing would be if there was some mechanical way to match color with value so that really small numbers were green, and bigger numbers were yellow, and even bigger numbers were like orange. 
and the really biggest numbers were red. Does anybody want to see if we can summon up the, the gods of Excel? <laughs> Check that out. Now you can look at this and stop worrying about the numbers because the pattern shows up if there is one. But this is a vector of in. It's not particularly interesting. That's why it's first. It's not particularly interesting. Let's look at a vector of string. <coughs> oh, see something? I'm not telling you what's going on yet. I want you to get you. These are small data structures. The next round, the next set of eight after these four. But just take a look. I'm going to move on. This is an unordered set of int. And now we see this. I'm going to, yes? Uh, okay, so are these averages across multiple experiments? Yes. These, these things have been run God knows how many times, and then we get rid of the top and the bottom and take the, the average of like the, the eight in the middle. Uh, what's wrong? What's the, I'm just curious as to what the, uh, uh, what's, the, what's, the what's the variance is. I don't, I don't have the statistic that you're asking for, but what I will tell you is, it, I, I know what you're trying to say. Is it all over the place? For, for these first four, it's very large. Especially the first one, it's, it's crazy. Where it calms down is the slightly larger data structures. You see what I'm saying? The, 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 the DS1 is, for all intents and purposes, useless. But it makes a nice picture. So that's why I'm not spending a lot of time. Here's an unordered set of string. And you can take a look. Now, remember, I just want to point out that these are the global allocators, the red ones. These are the monotonic, the green ones. Multipool, the orange ones. Multipool of mono, the slightly less green ones. So from a distance, when you look at this from a distance, this is horrible, this is really good, and these are in between. That's a big, big picture. Yes? A question about the multi pool. Uh, what is its backing allocator if not the monotonic one? Uh, the multi pool allocator is backed by the global allocator. The multi pool of monotonic is backed by the monotonic, which is backed by the global allocator. All right, this was just to get you oriented. Any questions on this? Now let's get to something a little more beefy. Any questions? These are the data structures here. Uh, we, we have a composite uh, elements. They're larger. We wanted the run times to be comparable. So we created an intermediate element size of 2 to the 7th. And so we stuck that thing in the middle. So the outer size is s. The inner size is fixed to k. Stays the same. And the experiment repetitions are like this. So as this gets uh, as the outer size gets bigger, the repetitions get smaller. That's the idea. And we just, we're just trading off the, the container size, right? Smaller containers, more of them, or bigger ones, not so many. Trons, that's it. It's just to see how it affects it. Remember, that's the log, powers of 2. This is DS5. Now let's take a closer look. AS1.97. AS2.1. That means that with a virtual function call, it's slightly more expensive on this particular one for the global allocators. Just take a look here. 1920, 1919, 1922, 1919. It's almost within the noise thing. And I want to tell you that Clang does not devirtualize uh, pretty much ever. At least it didn't while we were doing this, but GCC does. And it's not a surprise because the compiler has access both to the container and the inline methods of the allocator. The same code gets laid down either way. Or it can. So I'm just saying, this is just a fact. Now, and that's not always the case. Notice that the winking makes a difference here. See these green bands? Those are the winking bands. Why? I don't really know. I would have thought that if the virtual function call was expensive, Winking would make a big difference. But virtual function call isn't expensive, and winking still makes a big difference. So that means it's, it's, it's doing something interesting. It's helping. Something, something is getting done here that's a good thing. It's not the virtual function call. It's the actual allocation that's being winked out, not the virtual function call. All right, let's look at data structure six. This has little virtual function overhead. You can see just by the pattern, right? You can see that this pair of two is not any different than this, just by looking at the color. 
Now, turns out for this data structure, you do see a difference. There is an overhead for the virtual functions in both cases, but the winking buys back a lot. So when there is overhead for the virtual function, the winking gets you a lot of it back. Do you want to stare at this for a second? This is the next data structure. This is the one following right after its vector bundle instead of string. And here, there is a difference in the virtual function, but the winking matters. And so if you look at the original one, and then the virtual one with the winking, this is 26 and this is 24. It's better. Now keep in mind that we're comparing monotonic, which is the winner, against this. This is a factor of four or better, more better than that. So if people are interested in a factor of four improvement on a short running, build it up, use it and tear it down, that's what you got here. Any questions on that? They were randomized, string sizes were 33 to 1,000, random uniform distribution. Okay. John, yes. I have a question which may be related. Uh, by looking at the winking results, are these less than the garbage collection? Because it's like more. Oh, oh, oh God, I'm going to be ill. <laughs> we are not blessing garbage collection. We are the garbage collector. When we write a destructor, we are collecting our own damn garbage. What we've done is we've got a huge truck, gone through the village and said, throw your stuff in here, we'll dump it once. But the uh, winking does not call the destructor, right? There are two kinds of winking. The first kind of winking does call the destructor. But the real winking doesn't. And that's okay. Because unless the type says that it manages a resource, which it must, otherwise you're in that group of people that don't believe in documentation, that's fine. Remind me not to hire you if you're in that group. OK. By the way, if anybody likes this free commercial, send me mail, jlakos at bloomberg.net. Send your resume. I'll take care of it. Uh, that was a quick infomercial. Uh, if you like this stuff. If you don't like it, please. OK. This is DS9. This is unordered set of vector of int, DS10. Just take it in. You see the monotonic is winning. Now, the monotonic is winning, but there's definitely some cost, definitely some virtual function cost here, but there's a winking back benefit. And the last one is unordered set of unordered set of string. And you can see there's not too much virtual function call cost, but there's winking benefit because there's a lot of pieces in here that don't have to get destroyed. A lot. I think you get the idea. You get hold of these slides and spend like a month reading this stuff. I'm just giving you a tour. Global allocators are always inferior in this case. What if we just ignore them and look at the slides again, quickly this time? DS1s, so we're not looking at the global allocators. Now things start to jump out. This is all kind of doesn't count. This is the first one. It's a vector, one allocation, it doesn't matter. But. This is a poor choice, consistently a poor choice, very consistently a poor choice. That doesn't mean it's a bad allocator. John, I have a question. Yes? Are both your containers using the same allocator? Yes. And the same constraints? Let's say it's a uh, both, when you say both of my containers, so let, me try, let me try this again. This is, this is the global allocator, global allocator accessed via a virtual function. This is the monotonic allocator, accessed via virtual function, not accessed via type parameter. This is winking it and not winking it, winking it and not winking it. But the allocation happens in multiple classes. OK, so let me be clear. There are 14 different allocators here, 14. We're trying all 14 for each size of this data structure. There are 12 data structures. For 12 data structures, for 14 allocation strategies, for uh, 11 different powers of two, we're trying all of it. All of it. Yes? Uh, the way I understand the question is that you have a vector of sets and you're using the same allocator. <coughs> right? like the of OK, in the first vector of sets, I'm using this one. Then I'm using this one. Then I'm using no, this no, one. No, that's not the question. In any one container, it's always the same allocator. OK. That's the question. okay. 
So as I said, we're just going to cruise through this because my time is short. I am going to go over by five minutes. I guarantee that. Notice that the multi-pool is not our friend in this case. So just quickly to recap, if I put a question mark, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at this. The access locality is low by design. The memory utilization is one by design. We allocate it, we use it, we get rid of it. Contention is zero. Do you understand how the dimensions work? Takeaways, global allocators are consistently inferior when dealing with systems having short focus duration irrespective of contention. For systems having high utilization use, such as those modeled in this benchmark, a monotonic allocator is always superior, especially when applied to a static buffer residing on the program stack, similar in effect to alloc A and C. Since I'm low on time, questions at the bar? Okay. All right, long running time multiplex systems, ASIO. Okay, what are we gonna do? We're gonna model something that is time sliced. We're gonna do a little here, a little here, a little here, a little here, a little here. This is typical of servers, right? This is what Bloomberg does, right? Okay, considerations, access locality, physical and temporal. We wanna simulate concurrent systems. We want locality to dominate the results so pitifully that it doesn't matter how long it took to set it up. If we set it up well, that's what matters. So here are my subsystems. I have a system and I have a bunch of subsystems and I'm gonna visit them in order in a round robin sort of way. So I'm gonna model this as simply as I can. What did I just do here? Oh yeah. and then. I realize I lost the slide. Oops, it's okay. Well, I know where to, I know where to get it. Um, I was going to do that that in two steps. I was going to go from this to one of those with all the systems here, but it, it got it got uh, it got moved. I'll live. Creation plan. Okay, we're going to build it up. We build up a data structure vector of list of int, uh, having all the same links. So we're going to try to do that in a way that's consistent and everything that we do is, is just to build it up and tear it down. We will get the creation, the build up and tear down times if we want them. So <clears throat> building up the system, let's do it. Here's a vector, here's our memory. So we just allocated a vector in one chunk. We're gonna ignore the cache for now. Now we're gonna allocate an int link. It goes right there, you see it? We're going to allocate a second link, and it goes right there. We're going to allocate a bunch of links, and through the amazingness of PowerPoint, it goes right there. And then we're going to allocate the last link, and surprise, it goes there. Then we're going to go to the next and allocate it and it, and then we're going to go over here and avoid a context switch. And then we're going to go here and do it again. And we're going to come back here and avoid a context switch. Okay, that's two of them. Now, I presume you know what this is going to look like. Right? And we're going to avoid a context switch here and do that in two steps. One, two. Do you realize how long it takes to explain this without slides? Wait till you see. Access plan. Visit each system in turn for each subsystem Write to each of the end values in order. Repeat the sequence of writes for total of I iterations. Advance to the next system, subsystem. Repeat for our repetitions. The result is wall clock runtime. Okay? No memory is allocated or deallocated. Alert. Write to each end. So what does it mean to write to each end? Well, here's the first subsystem. Let's write to the... That's what it means. Now, you never know how many subsystems we're going to have. It could be very long. I don't know. Who wants to bet? I think it's about done. OK. So that, that's, that's one time through. Now, we're going to repeat for i iterations. So i is 2. So we're going to go through each subsystem twice. Whoops. Sorry. I got too excited. I did a lot of the stuff that I did was to take away from my thumb pressing so it would do it automatically.
All right, so that's the first subsystem. Advance to the next subsystem. Hey, John. Yes? Can you give me what you're reading? It's actually an increment. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're speeding up the system. Now we're going into warp drive. I trust everybody gets the idea. This is a long running system, so I have to torture you. There will be no surprises on this one, but there will be some amusement on the last one. Oh wait, we don't know how many subsystems there are. There could be a lot of subsystems. So if I is, uh, excuse me, if the, if the size of the subsystem is very small, then the number of subsystems could be very large. Anyway, when we finally get through that, we do the last one the same as we did all the rest, twice through, and we're good. All right, repeat the entire process for our repetitions. So what does that look like? Well, keep in mind that this number is going to add up to 256. When I say add up, the exponents add up. It's going to add up to 8. So we go through the thing one time, what we just did. And that's one iteration. Then we go through it a second time. <laughs> it's a long-running program. I want you to feel the pain. Do you know how long it took to animate this? <laughs> So the idea is we're going to just go through 2 to the 7th times a large number, and then we'll move on to the next slide. Everybody gets the idea? We go through forever. <laughs> forever. Forever. It runs for days. OK. The results are experiments are wall clock runtime. No memory is allocated or deallocated. Here's the pseudocode. Notice it's pseudocode, so I could comment out the using namespace. I really like that. Then uh, here's what we do. We create a vector of int. We build it up like that. See, that's what it's supposed to look like. See those little ints there? And then we, uh, the current system, uh, 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 this is how we access the current element. So it's just like that. And then we're going to do that for each E in system K. So each one of those is going to happen. And then we're going to do that some number of iterations like that. And then we're going to have some number of subsystems down there. And for whatever's left over, we're going to go through it forever. Get the idea? That's the algorithm. Does everybody understand the pattern? So quadruply nested loop. Big, big time. OK? The product here is going to trade off. The product there is going to trade off. So we have total number n. We have the memory, the physical size, and the temporal axes. So I'm just going to let you read this because my voice is going. You get the idea? We're going to trade those two off. So what does that mean? We're going to create a huge number of, 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 of accesses. We're going to try subsystem size 0, which means one link. We're going to have two, uh, uh, 2 million, 2 to the 21. So uh, what do I call that? Anyway, meg. We have two meg subsystems. We keep going down here until we have one system of size 2 to the 21. And that's it. That's what we're going to look at. So that's a big range, right? Maybe we'll get some information where allocators help. We're going to do the same thing for temporal locality. If we are iterating eight times in one subsystem before we go to the next, that's temporal locality. We're going through, when I say eight, I mean two to the eight. If we're doing it zero times, which means two to the one, one time, it's one time. It's important. So we take the cross product of these, and what does this mean? This means eight subsystems of size two to the 18. No, I said it backwards. This is, this is, this is 18 subsystems of size eight. That's what that means. This is two times through. This is what we saw. This isn't like the previous example. Two times through, uh, and then 22 to the, tw ah, two times through. Ah! It's not two times through. It's actually, I should have done this one. So this is another bug. This is four times through, and uh, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and four, four mega, mega uh, repetitions, four million repetitions. All right, so I see a couple of bugs in this. All right, so I may have gotten this wrong. I have been up late recently. So anyway, this says previous. So this is two iterations uh, because this is, yeah, but this is right. Two iterations and 128 repetitions. That is right. 2 to the 7th is 128. Now, if I move it over one, it's four iterations, 64 repetitions. 
If I move it over one, it's eight iterations, 32 repetitions. And here I'm going the other direction, eight subsystems of size 256K. This is 16 subsystems of size 128K. And this is 32 subsystems of size 64K. You get the idea, right? Everything here is measured in wall clock time in seconds. And the pattern that I showed you there about the way the numbers are increasing up and out is a suggestion. Okay. Whoops, it paused on me. So let, let me go back to one. So we're starting here. We're starting here. And the first thing I do is I read in my vector. And then I read in my first subsystem. So that's once I read in my first subsystem, I'm in cache and I'm looping on my first subsystem. For as long as I want to, nothing's happening. Then I go to my second subsystem and I read that in and nothing's happening. And then I go to my third one and I read it in and nothing's happening. And so on and so forth. And it keeps going until when? Until I get through all of my repetitions. So it's cycling through, but I can't fit my whole system in. If I could fit my whole system in, it's all meaningless. So the point is it's going through and it's cycling. You follow what I'm saying? But at least I can do all my iterations, all my locality in one shot. That's a big deal. Okay. The world is not as nice as that. If it were that nice, we wouldn't need allocators probably. Uh, but it's not. So the shuffle plan, what we're going to do is we're going to shuffle the memory. And we are going to do that by moving stuff around. Pop the front element, push it on somewhere else, advance to the next subsystem, repeat until all the elements are sufficiently shuffled. Resulting experiment is a shuffled system. And we can also measure the shuffling time. Because anyway, so this is the way it works. We're going to ignore the cache. I'm going to copy that value. I'm going to move it away. Move that guy up. Yeah, this is easy animation. No problem at all. So what we're doing is we're creating a free link. We're creating a hole. And that's because we've given it back. We've deallocated it. Now we've allocated. And I'm doing it this way because it's likely a pooling allocator. We'll likely get the same one back. But we don't know that. Can't assume that, but that's what's, that's what's happening here. And now look, it gets a different color. Now that color corresponds to the subsystem that's doing this. Now, I think you're going to get the idea, and sadly I'm going to have to repeat this for a while so that you just follow, but uh, the idea is we're going to go to each subsystem. There's the freed link. This is the reallocated link. Okay, then the next one, come on. See, the trouble is you, you get the idea in the beginning and then you have to try to um, speed it up so that it's as fast as it can possibly be. And I think I can work on this one some more, but I literally ran out of time trying to speed this stuff up. But what I can do is I cannot context switch each time so I can stay here and you know what's going to happen and you can just see the pattern a little less painless, painful. But you see how it's shuffling? And we're going to go through this thing once, and then we're going to go through it again and again and again, but you're not going to see that. Thank goodness. Is there a reason you uh, didn't do splice or whatever? It does? Uh, well, first of all, splice is the devil. Aside from that, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I didn't use splice because all I'm doing is copying values back and forth. Splice is a good way to slow down your program. In fact, you'll see that. What we are, in fact, doing is splicing. Because what we're doing is we're giving it back and getting the same one and moving it somewhere else. We're actually splicing. That's the funny thing. Splice is a very bad operation. Should never have been allowed to exist. We want to get away from spl uh, splicing. We want to copy values because we want to keep our subsystems local because the value of moving something quickly when your access pattern goes to hell is, is zero. It's negative. It's horrible. So... Anyway, this is the last one. Thank goodness. So that's the freed one. We put it back. Okay. Go. Okay. So this is one, one shuffle. One, one shuffle pass, but it's not a shuffle. A shuffle is when we go through all of them and disperse them. So 
we repeat this however uh, many subsystem sizes as we want. And I know this isn't random, but I didn't have the patience to actually put in random ones. So pretend that's random. This is diffusion. It's hard to see that. All right, that's another bug. This is not... This is diffusion. This is not fragmentation. Fragmentation looks different. This is fragmentation. Okay. I'm going to have to write 20 on that. <laughs> this is worse fragmentation. This happens with coalescing allocators. We don't have them. If you ever use the word fragmentation when you're dealing with a pooling allocator, just slap yourself. It doesn't exist. Or if it does exist, you have a broken pooling allocator. And I may be overstating that because what does happen is you break your memory up into the different pools, but the idea is it tends to look more like this. So you see what's happening here. Every time I access one of those elements, I have to flush out a whole cache line. And now I've gone one complete iteration, and now I've gone, there's going to be the second iteration. You see how many cache lines I've ejected because of this? So the other one was cruising, and now I had to bring in the cache line twice per iteration. It's a sad world. Okay. So here's the overall plan. By the way, you put up with all of this so that I can get to something useful now. I appreciate it. We're going to compare accessing after with accessing before the shuffle. And we have the shuffle only. So each of these is going to provide times. We could subtract from A the cost of setup, but it's negligible, as you're about to see. So we'll ignore that, and really it's going to be the ratio of accessing after divided by accessing before to see the degradation ratio due to diffusion based on some number of shuffles. Negligible. The C's are negligible. This is what you need to remember. Create shuffle access over create access shuffle. We're doing the same thing. We're just doing them in a different order. Which one do you think is faster? Before or after the shuffle? Before the shuffle, trust me. All right, so here's what shuffling does for you. This is iterations. We're going to, for this experiment, we can do 10 iterations before we move on to the next subsystem. This is diffusion. This is no shuffling. You're not surprised that it's one. This is one list cycling. You're not surprised that it's one. This is after one complete shuffle. I, it's worth looking at, especially over here. We're talking about a factor of 10, 15. It's a big ass difference. And so we're going to standardize on five shuffles. So five shuffles from now on. So this is an important, at, at a million, at a million subsystems, we're talking about Serious, serious degradation. So 11 after one shuffle, 15 after two shuffles. Any questions on this? Okay. That was just to show you that there's the possibility of using a local allocator to help. I didn't use a local allocator at all up till now, right? I just showed you diffusion, and I showed you how bad it gets. So when it gets bad, what do you do? You go to the doctor, he gives you some medicine. What's the medicine? Guess. Local allocators, okay, remember this? So the larger the subsystem, the, the, uh, the fewer there are, and the fewer the iterations, the more repetitions. And here it's a real number. And here's a picture, it's a 3D color map, which I'm very proud of. And it's showing what we saw before, which is without allocators, this is degradation ratio is after to before. This is without allocators. At the peak, it's 15. Now, this is without, okay, we're shuffling five times each. We're varying from 256 iterations here. Uh, uh, that's, that's high temporal locality all the way to one iteration here. All right? Okay. This is an anomaly. We don't know what that is exactly but it's in the case where the subsystem size is one. 
So something funky is happening when the subsystem size is one and the number of iterations is two and one. What we think it is, is the difference between two iterations and one iteration is, is the most dramatic there. So that's why this area, but it's not really important because again, it's a pathological corner case, but it's repeatable, which is kind of amazing. Anyway, so this is the sweet spot. When you get close to some magic number, it turns out on this machine, it's about two to the 18th uh, in system size. You get the, the, you get the maximum difference between where without being shuffled, everything fits in the cache and with being shuffled, only one thing fits in the cache. And if you go either direction, either more things don't fit in the cache or more things do fit in the cache. So the difference is less extreme. So you understand that. 15 is important. Now we're gonna use some magic and we're gonna Excel magic. And we are going to continuously deform this chart into an Excel spreadsheet. I know you always do this. Don't do it at home though. This is a heat map that shows system size versus number of iterations, but this is the high temporal locality, this is the high physical locality, and as you can see, as you move away with less locality, things get nasty, okay? So this is uh, more smaller subsystems, subsystems reaccessed more frequently. That's what that means, all right? Now that you know that, this is the anomaly. I'm gonna take it out. There's the number, the magic number two to the 18th for this machine. So we're gonna insert a local allocator, okay? So here's our subsystem, we put in our local allocators, they're all pulling from the global allocator, but now they're doing their own thing. And what does that look like to the memory? That looks like this. We put a box around our memory. Which local allocator strategy should we use? Monotonic. Monotonic, why? What is the shuffle gonna do to us? What if we have an allocator that isn't a pooling allocator? If we use the monotonic, we, we, we're shuffling five times, our utilization is very low, that's a problem. So the answer is we can't use a monotonic. We can use A7, A9, A11, or A13, and that's because of the shuffle. The utilization is not good enough for us. Utilization were one, we could use a monotonic. Got it? Okay. Now, with the allocator, look at the ratio of before and after. The degradation is an order of magnitude better. An order of magnitude better? Hello? Okay. So, with local allocators, with without local allocators, and this is the punchline, by the way, this is the ratio of not using a local allocator to using one. That's what this maps. This is the ratio of not using it to using it and we're talking numbers that are more than 10. So here's the map of not using it to using it, and that's the anomaly, and we'll zoom in on that, and there's an order of magnitude right there. You see it? It's 10 times better to use local allocators in this case. Sometimes it's more better, sometimes it's less better. Down here, yeah, this is only twice as good. Yeah, who cares? All right, we'll do it again for m equals 25. We'll do it quickly, same set of things, 25, it's the same picture. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it is the same shape. It's reproducible, we did it for numbers. I think we did it for like uh, 14 to two to the 27th. So we did a whole range. I showed you two pictures, they're all the same. And here's the example without. We'll take out the funny thing. Same number, the same 18 when we get that threshold. Same number, so that's a machine property. And look, with allocators, we're back again at 2.5. That's an order of magnitude better. And this is when we take the, uh, the ratio. This is without to with. And we look at this again. We'll take out the anomaly. And please take a look. This is a factor of 16 speed up over not using. That's the ratio of using to not using. Now, I don't know how to argue with this. But we can reproduce this and you can reproduce this so for what it's worth. So allocation density is nil, right? We don't do a lot of allocating. The variation is nil. We're measuring access locality. The memory utilization is one, except for the shuffle. That's a bug. 
This is unknown. In this implementation, it was one because we were using a pooling allocator, but I have to put a one with a caveat. An allocator contention is zero. We're not, out, we're not using multiple threads. I get it. That should be a 10. <laughs> All right. So for long-running subsystems, the speed of allocation, deallocation operators themselves may be entirely irrelevant to the overall performance. Partitioning memory corresponding to subsystems have physical and temporal locality uh, can nonetheless make an enormous difference in overall runtime. The takeaway here is there are systems where your allocation operations are negligible, but where the memory sits is everything. So whether you have a virtual function call or not is absolutely meaningless in this case. Winking is meaningless. All of it's meaningless. It's the access locality that matters. Questions? You'll be pleased to know that those were the hard benchmarks. The, the other two are real quick. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to the third one. Short running varying memory reusability. Like a pump, just going away. <clears throat> kind of like the shuffle. Anyway, considerations. We want to investigate utilization. We don't want locality to dominate the results. We're going to measure some uh, sub-dimensions. For example, the total amount of memory allocated, the maximum amount of memory allocated, and the chunk size of the memory that's being allocated. You'll be pleased with this. Instead of, instead of uh, actually explaining this, I'm just going to show you. This is how we build it up. Then we proceed like this until we use up our total memory. Isn't this better than trying to explain it? It's just, it's just much better. OK? We do that, and then we get rid of it. That's the experiment. OK. The results are absolute runtimes, and they're a percentage of the default global allocator. Three more considerations. Winking out doesn't matter because there's only a little bit of memory left at the end. No mathematical possibility of having that make a difference. And we anticipate trouble with monotonic allocators in this case because we have a pump. Whenever you have a pump, low utilization, you're in trouble. OK? Remember this guy? When we hit the maximum over here, everything is going to pass through. That's the, that's the multiple allocator. So when your chunk size gets too big, you can have a problem. So this is uh, exponents, powers of 2. Total memory allocated is 2 to the 30. OK, what's next? That's uh, the maximum size. Uh, we're going we're gonna to vary it from 15 to 20. Then when we get to 20, we're going to vary the chunk size from 10 to 15. This is not a complete treatment. It's just illustrative, but it shows you some interesting properties. So now having done that, absolute times for the uh, AS1 and relative each one on a row by row basis. So 12 is a magic number. That's 2 to the 12th. That's 2048. As soon as we exceed that, bad stuff happens. So 2 to the 31, bad stuff is happening. But now if you look at the monotonic and the monotonic backed by the multi-pool, we have an opportunity for failure. So the next one, we fail. Do you see why? We're failing here because of pass-through, and we're failing here because of total memory requested. We've exceeded the memory of the machine. So you've been warned. And we can keep changing things, and it doesn't change much. You get the idea? So. Density is high, chunk size variation. That's not true. It's not zero, because we were varying the chunk size. See, when I fill these things out when I'm tired, it's bad. The variation in chunk size was appreciable. We, we tried different chunk sizes. So that's, uh, is that true? No, that's not, that's not the benchmark. I guess I'm getting tired. The variation in chunk size for any given experiment is zero, but we looked at different chunk sizes. So one of the things we were sort of considering is how does chunk size uh, fit into this. But anyway, I might have to put that as a question mark. The locality is low. We did that by design. The memory utilization is what we're looking at, but we did that um, mostly focused on low utilization. We didn't do anything with high utilization. And of course, there's no contention. So the takeaway tips is never use a monotonic allocator by itself when the utilization U is low and the total number of bytes allocated is large, e.g. in a loop. Don't use a monotonic allocator if you're a pump. You're a pump, don't use it. Use a pooling allocator. Beware that a multiple allocator passes its request 
to the backing allocator when the chunk size of memory being allocated exceeds the maximum pool size, e.g. 2048. So you have to know that if you're, if you're allocating a lot of chunks and they exceed 2048 and you're backed by a multi-pool, a, a monotonic allocator, you could overflow the monotonic allocator and then you're SOL. Okay? All right. So we have one more benchmark, multi-threaded. It's pretty straightforward. Really, the point of this, we're interested in knowing what contention is going on. What, well, how does it affect us compared to the global allocator? So the plan is for each of a number W of worker threads, for a total of I iterations that we're going to choose, I and N are very closely coupled here. Um, we're going to run this experiment, and at the end, join all the threads. The experiment is run times, and it's relative to the first column. So the plan is, did I put the plan in twice? I thought I deleted that. Sorry about that. Another bug. Additional considerations. Uh, the allocation density D is high, because that clearly um, that's most, most of what we're doing, two-thirds of our operations. And each thread accesses its own private unsynchronized local allocator, unless it's the global allocator. No contention occurs unless we go to the global allocator, because the local allocators are doing their own thing. Uh, and in this benchmark, we really didn't try to vary contention. It's either zero or it's, it's stinking high, pretty much. Okay? And there were more processors on our machine than the, the, the number that we, we uh, used here, W, to up to eight. So here we go. I did this stuff literally after noon today. So if there's a bug here, I wouldn't be at all surprised. The number of iterations is 2 to the 15th. The, the allocation size is, is 2 to the 6th. The number of threads is varying over the course of this. And now I want you to look at the monotonic, OK? This is a bad choice, because what are we doing? We're in a loop, right? So this is also important. This is a single thread. Now, it doesn't look like it makes much of a difference here, but let's just keep our eye on it. This is more than one thread, OK? So we go to 2 to the 7th. Notice what happened on the first row. Having a pooling allocator here doesn't help you that much, right? Because it's just one. Now, if you have only one subsystem, right? Um, a global allocator and a local allocator is the same thing. So you don't expect it to help you. But it will make a difference if you have more than one thread, because then you have more than one subsystem. So when you have multiple subsystems, having local allocators becomes very important. All right, so you see what's happening here. We're, we're increasing the number of iterations, and things are pretty much staying the same. We're not seeing any great change. There's no, there's no huge amount of information here, but I will, I will point out that the global allocator is sitting over here around 100%, and these numbers are less than a quarter. So just by virtue of the fact of having this stuff local, you eliminate all of the Herculean efforts that the global allocator is trying to do with thread affinity and all of that good stuff. Now, I'm sure you'd be horrified to know if you have a thread pool, there's no way the global allocator can map the subsystem memory to the thread because it's already diffused throughout all creation, and there's no way it can do it. There's no possibility that it can do it. So you need to manage your memory and keep your memory with your subsystems and that's why we get paid the big bucks, because we don't let the compiler do it for us, or the global allocator, because it can't. All right, so allocation density, high. Variation, zero. Locality is low. Utilization, nil, because it's a pump, like the other one. And the allocator contention is either zero or it's high. All right, take away from this. Make subsystems memory explicit using local allocators to obviate affinity in thread pools, as well as thread-aware global memory allocators. Use a composite multi-pool mono allocation strategy when utilization is low, uh, especially when variation V is high, so long as the size of the individual chunks is smaller than the pooling threshold. So even if utilization is low, as long as, long as the chunks are small, the multi-pool will, will save you. But it won't save you if your chunks get large. Questions or discussion on this? All right. This is just what you guys all know what fault sharing is, right? It's when two people, different subsystems unrelated, are trying to access the same thing. 
So two or more concurrent threads contending for independent data unfortunately located in the same cache line. Well, let's take a look at what, what this is. These guys, if I, if I go to this, that's diffused memory, right? And then, come on. When I try to get in, that's massive false sharing, right? Massive false sharing is bad, but I can fix that by putting these guys in, and then I don't get any false sharing by design. So instead of going, you know, obviously you can, you can write a program that, that, that almost guarantees you're going to get false sharing. You can write one, and you can write one that doesn't almost guarantee you'll get false sharing. But this is how you write a program where you guarantee that you don't get false sharing. You don't have the memory diffused throughout the system and possibly conflict. Does that make sense? Okay. But there was a problem. The problem was we had a bug. It wasn't in the benchmarks. It was in how we collected the data. And we actually swapped a few of the allocation strategy columns in benchmark one, and we were confused as heck. So what did we do? We got this co-op student to go and recreate all of the benchmarks that we did by talking to the authors of the benchmark. He wasn't allowed to look at the code at all. He had to redo it by word of mouth. This was like a clean room thing. And he didn't do it at Bloomberg. He did it in Canada somewhere. And we said, as a separate effort, uh, uh, well, a separate effort, we said, this guy's going to go off and do it. And he went off and did an A triple plus job, came up with a new dimension fragmentability, a measure of, pot of the potential of a subsystem's allocated memory to become diffused throughout physical memory as a result of the interference of other subsystems' memory allocation. If a subsystem is fragmentable, i.e., other subsystems are present in the process and the subsystem allocates more than one chunk of memory, F is greater than zero. So you get the idea, it's also on the scale. Okay, so to give you an idea, oh, by the way, you hired him. Uh, if you guys come up with another dimension, it's all good. Um, so vector is low fragmentability, which is why it's so awesome, right? Because what is a linked list? High fragmentability. Here, here's a vector of string. Medium low fragmentability. Unordered set of in. Medium high fragmentability. Unordered set of string. High fragmentability. Because you're walking through two things that could be on different cache lines. You see what I'm saying? So this is, this is nasty. Make sense? OK. So we went to the standards meeting. He presented. The standards meeting was sold. I hope as much as they, at least they put it in the standard. I hope you guys are also sold. But uh, we got everything that we wanted in. So it's now available in C17. Here are the references. This is the paper that we're talking about at the bottom. And conclusions. Uh, what can I say? Uh, I think they're worth it. Um, what situations merit their use? And in the interests of time, I'm not going to read all of these. I'm just going to say to improve or preserve performance, and there are a number of different ways we can do that. You can look at the video. Place objects in a different kind of memory, and there are a number of different kinds of memory that we might want to do that with. And then to measure, test, control, or debug memory, and we have all these different kinds of interesting uh, ones, I'm going to add another one to that, which is called an alarm allocator, which is if your sequential buffer exceeds the, the, the buffer space you've allocated for it on the program stack, its backing allocator will send a message to the console and say, you used up your buffer. You better make it larger on the next release. It's awesome. It's just too much fun. All right, so I'm going to add that there. How are they applied effectively? So this is the quiz. Have to have a quiz. Suppose these are the, the program is large. So this is a large program. Small program, this is where you have locality, where you don't have locality. So if you don't have locality and it's a small program, use a global allocator. What if you have a large program with lots of locality or the potential for locality? So use a local allocator. What about over here? What if it's a small program but I've got a lot of potential for locality? What about our, what about our benchmarks that we... Uh, we saw before. All right, we might use a local allocator if we feel like it. What about if we have a large system and there's no potential for any locality because it's a big ball of mud? What do you do? Well, 
Seriously. All right. Suppose the subsystems exhibits high memory utilization. It's the small one, and it doesn't. So it's low utilization, small. Use the global allocator. Suppose it's high utilization, and it's large. Use the monotonic, because it's high utilization. Suppose it's over here, and it's, uh, it's high utilization, but it's not large. That's benchmark one. Use the local monotonic allocators, right? Why not? And suppose it's large, it's large, but it has low utilization. This is important. This slide is really important. What do you use? Right, use a local multi-pool allocator. This is, this is, this is like money, money slide. Okay, and finally, a lot of concurrency. All right, so little concurrency, and it's a small program, you know. A lot of concurrency, big program, I think we know. We use whichever one's appropriate. Okay, it's a small program, but there's a lot of concurrency. I would use a local allocator. I would not rely on my, uh, my, my system allocator to figure out which thread is connected with each subsystem in general. And over here, just to round it out, why not? Just use local allocators wherever you can. So just to remind you guys, in almost every case, local allocators are no worse and often better than global allocators. And in some cases, it can be an order of magnitude difference. Um, the overhead for virtual co function calls, as we've seen, is slim to none. And sometimes it's completely meaningless because the problem doesn't care. So you need to know that. So our conclusion is uh, object level control over memory uh, allocation is intrinsic to C++ and must always be there if we hope to maintain this language's supremacy as the best performing high level systems language. Supporting object specific memory allocation is admittedly uh, an added burden exacerbated by an initially difficult to use model, which is finally being addressed in C++ 17 by polymorphic memory resources. Any future incarnation of SDL should incorporate the lessons elucidated here. And finally, the real finally is density variation, locality, utilization, and contention, and don't forget fragmentability. So what are we going to remember? Okay? And that's the talk.